My name is Christian Stevens, MD, PhD candidate, as introduced, and I'm going to jump right in. Um, so first, this is kind of what this project looks like from a 50,000-foot view. Uh, what we have here is that we have a subject that's getting an MMR vaccine boost. Uh, you know, MMR is typically given the first year of life, so this is about 50 plus years later. And then at day six, we're isolating PBMCs, and we're putting it down two pipelines. We're putting the B cells down one pipeline. We're going to do single cell transcriptomics. Um, and we're also going to try to look for those full length paired heavy and light chain antibodies. And then the other pipeline, the non B cells, we're going to use in order to get the germline DNA for the, uh, for the entire IG loci. And so, really nifty to be able to do this all with kind of the same technology. Um, and really exciting work I'm going to show you on the single cell transcriptomics using just Oxford nanopore stuff, not having to utilize Illumina to pull out cell barcodes. Um, for those who were able to catch it, Owen Harrington did a great talk on the new tool Sockeye, which I think came out on Wednesday publicly, um, which allows us to do some cool stuff. So I'm going to try to give a quick crash course in some B-cell development for those who are not immunologists. Um, but just from the very highest level, antibodies are built to stick to things. Right here we have in green the variable region. That is the part of the antibody that's sticking to things. And then you have this constant region, which in reality is not always so constant. And that's actually going to change out what the effector functions of that antibody. So binding alone is not the only job that the antibody does. But I think what's really special and what often gets glazed over when we think about what B cells and antibodies do is that, you know, in human DNA, we only have so many bases to work with. And yet the human capacity for antibody diversity is getting to a million trillion different potential antibodies between all of the recombination, the hypermutation that can occur. And so you have to have a tool set that allows you to recognize any antigen that is not self that could possibly exist. That's really hard to do, and it's why it's such a special system, and it's worth talking about how it happens. But so for our project in particular, we have the MMR vaccine. That's the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. It's uh, trivalent, three inactivated viruses. Um, and this is the you know, whole kind of setup for the B-cell development. And we're going to skip past a lot of it and really look at just the B-cells themselves. Um, and so again, we're trying to develop this antibody, and it's actually made up of two distinct pieces that help amplify what the diversity is. We have the heavy chain and the light chain, judged by their size. Uh, we have a really nice uh, kind of 3D structure there, and it's worth thinking about exactly how this develops. So you know, every cell in your body has the germline uh, loci for this. Um, when you want to get to a final thing, one B cell makes only one antibody. And so it has to do actual recombination at the DNA level in order to produce that potential diversity. And so it does it one step at a time. We see that you get the uh, mu VDJ recombination, that's the heavy chain recombination first, and then we get the light chain recombination after that in two distinct steps. So by the time you get to a final B cell, you have a full DNA recombination happening and you're able to then produce the antibody. And so thinking about just exactly how that happens, you have a lot of different V genes that you can choose from. You have a lot of different D genes and J genes. This is just on the heavy chain. Um, and then you're able to, you know, a single B cell, as it goes through the process of recombination, selects just one of each of those. And so you already talked about the combinatorics involved, and that gives you a large diversity to work with. You then go through RNA splicing that gives you your constant region. We'll talk about how that can actually change too. Um, and then you get your kind of final protein right there. And the same happens on the light chain side, although it doesn't have the D. Um, and so after that, once you have this kind of full recombination that's occurred, an antigen comes in, you get activated because this is your antigen finally, you've been that B cell waiting in the wings, you go through proliferation, but during that process we also go through isotype switching and somatic hypermutation. Then you differentiate into plasmablasts, which produce tons of antibody, and memory B cells, which are going to sustain the memory of what you've seen before. Um, and it's important to just really think about what these isotypes do. So I talked about how the variable region is what allows you to bind to an antigen, but a lot of the effect of an antibody is not just whether it sticks or not, but it's what it's able to do downstream, so the effector functions. And that can be driven by the isotypes. Isotypes might decide whether you know, it helps push uh, antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity or whether it's just going to use neutralization or maybe even opsonization. That stuff happens down, uh, you know, below that variable region and dictates what happens. So this is also a uh, DNA recombination combination step that allows us to choose which of these isotypes we're going to switch to. And then lastly, there's even more, somatic hypermutation. So you might think, oh, I'm binding to the antigen and I'm doing great, but it would be great as each booster comes in or as each you know, new antigen exposure comes in if you can select higher and higher versions of those antibodies. And that happens through somatic hypermutation also at the DNA level. So this is the process here. We have our vaccinated uh, subject, um, and you, know, you go through. We expect those B cells to be activated. We expect to see plasma blasts in memory B cells. 
And it's important to you know, show here that we have uh, you know, different surface expression of these protein, these cell surface proteins. And from that, we're able to do some flow sorting, which is really nifty. Um, so we go through, and you have you know, live dead we're getting rid of. We have a big dump gate, because a lot of these PBMCs are going to be all kinds of things that you don't want that are not B cells. Um, and so once we are able to get that out, now you're differentiating these uh, plasma blasts and memory B cells here on the right-hand side by their CD38 and their CD27 expression. So what we see is that uh, right where it says P8 there, that's where we expect to see those memory B cells. Um, and at the P7 is where we expect to see the plasma blasts. And it's important to you know, consider that there are uh, big differences between the plasma blasts and the rest. They make up a very small proportion, but they really fly off the top right corner of this. And so we actually took blood at multiple time points in order to find that peak moment of uh, plasma blast proliferation. So that was really important to try to get you know, the number of cells that we're hoping to see here. And then we use 10x uh, sequencing to do the transcriptomics, but before that, we have the non-B cells. With those non-B cells, we're able to do some assembling of the Ig loci. Um, this is a lot of the really cool work that was happening over with the Oxford Nanopore team. So we have the genomic applications team that played a very large role here. Um, so for here, you have extracted genomic DNA. They did adaptive sampling. So what we have is 753 targets, uh, you know, 54 megabyte search space. And in here is everything in the Ig loci. Uh, it also includes some really nice other immune genes um, tacked in there. And from this, we're able to get you know, about 60x coverage at that Ig loci. And that allows you to do a personalized uh, you know, generation of this Ig assembly for this subject. Because we talked about there's all those different V, D, and J genes to, uh, genes to choose from, but within that, each individual is actually going to have a slightly different array of V or D or J than other individuals. So being able to assemble the germline sequence for this particular subject allows us you know, even more that we can do with this. And that only happens because we have this really nice long read sequencing with the adaptive sampling step as well. And from that, we're able to then you know, phase and get the haplotypes uh, for our individual. And it's really nice. Uh, we have uh, you know, basically single phase block haplotypes. This is just the uh, heavy chain right there. And then you get something that looks really nice like this. And you can go back, and you can do cool alignments back to it. Um, so this is the Ig loci for our specific patient. And you can see uh, this is you know, a transcript coming through the 10x pipeline. Um, and that's really what's, what Sakai is so nice for, is able to just use right out of that 10x pipeline. You're not doing anything too special after that. It's pulling out the cell barcode, the UMI, um, and you're getting exactly what are the, you know, what's the constant region, what's the V, what's the D, what's the J, and it's back aligning that. And one of the cool things that we found during this process was actually some potential novel alleles. So I don't know if you can tell, but the dark purple versus the light purple. Dark purple are previously seen V alleles, but these light purple are potentially novel V genes. So this is just one of those parts. And you know, when we think about what does the V gene do, it allows for a qualitatively different antibody. And so if you have a patient who has a particular subset of V genes that you're identifying, that gives them an ability to make qualitatively different antibodies than someone without that particular allele. And then what we see here in this graph is uh, the cell type associated with particular V gene alleles. We see the number of memory cells that we found in our set and the number of plasma blasts. We were able to find actually four individual V gene alleles that are associated with a higher plasma blast than memory B cell content, which is really exciting because this is what we're expecting to be the you know, immediate response to this trivalent vaccine. And you'll actually even see one of our two uh, potential novel alleles shows a subset of cells where their, paired, their uh, heavy chain, light chain paired stuff, the heavy chain V allele is this novel allele. So that's really exciting. And then you can actually go through and even synthesize those antibodies. And I'll talk about that at the end. So, What's really cool about this is being able to use single cell RNA-seq. We use both the Illumina and the ONT platforms, mostly as a gut check, with the new Sockeye pipeline. Um, and yeah, watch Owen's talk online. It's really fantastic uh, talking about what it's capable of. Um, we're able to do a lot of very cool things. And so we do these single cell transcriptomics. And right here, what we're looking at is this is the ONT expression levels. Each grid here is an individual cell, and every dot is an individual gene, and its relative expression level in Illumina and ONT. And we see really tight agreement, which makes sense. This is also a very homogenous cell population. These are all plasma blasts on which we've agreed on the cell barcode between both Illumina and ONT. But what's nice is, even though they're homogenous, we always expect between any two super homogenous cells to see a relatively consistent matchup here between gene expression. But we're seeing an increasingly consistent matchup with the matched cell barcodes. So that's nice. It's a good gut check that Illumina and ONT are capturing the same things for the most part. But I'll actually talk about where they start to differentiate a little bit. So looking just at what Illumina is able to grab us, this is now a little bit different. So we have um, each of these uh, boxes is 
you know, on the y-axis is one IGHG gene, and on the x-axis is another. So we talked about isotypes. These are actually subtypes of IgG. It's your classic kind of antibody that just binds straight out. When we think of antibodies, it's usually a picture of an IgG. Of these four subtypes, what we actually see, you know, so you're, you're expecting this is isotype differences, class switching. You expect no, you know, overlap between these. Each dot here is a single cell, and the level of expression of IgHG1 or 2 or 3 or 4. So when I compare 1 and 2 here, I see no correlation. That's a good thing. They should have different isotypes we shouldn't see in the single cell. What's a little bit tricky, though, is that for IgHG3, 4, and 1, we see significant overlap, no matter how you do that pairwise. We should not be seeing that. A single cell should only be showing one single isotype. So that's a problem. When we see that with Illumina, we wonder, is that going to show up in the ONT data set as well? And why might that show up? And so it's important to note for the Illumina stuff, when we talk about these different isotypes, for example, we look at, say, IgG1 and IgG3. They're nearly identical, except for a big difference here in this hinge region. And this hinge region has an important effect. This is a mucin-like hinge region, which has a lot of O-glycosylation. That has big downstream effector function changes. So when you do different subtypes here, the actual downstream effector functions might say affect whether it you know, does complement activation or ADCC, that antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity. Um, and what we're seeing is that because these are so similar, and because the hinge region is kind of downstream in the read, Illumina is not successfully picking up the difference. And those differences are potentially really important, and are just not things we've been able to look at in the past. And so when we look at ONT sequencing, we do not see these overlaps. That's really, really exciting. To be able to go through and see that our IgG1, our IgG2, our IgG3, and 4 are all not overlapping is exactly what we're hoping to see, it's what we're expecting to see, and it's what was really hard to pull out with the Illumina data. Um, and so it's nice to then look you know, very specifically at what we think is happening. And so on the y-axis here, we have the ONT expression levels, on the x-axis is Illumina, and we're seeing that what is happening a lot of the time is it's actually that highly expressed IGHG1 that's getting picked up and misassigned into IGHG3 and IGHG4 when Illumina is looking at it. And so because of that, we're able to actually map out more successfully and with more confidence what we're seeing for different isotypes in different individual cells. So these all here are plasmablasts. And this is using a subset of genes in order to produce this UMAP. And the coloration here is different isotypes, and I'll walk through them step by step. So in green, we have IgHA1. So this is a different isotype that we can work with. IgA, it tends to be found in kind of, you know, uh, uh, for like, you know, mucus layers and stuff. That's the kind of response that you get there. And we're seeing a nice kind of clean subgroup here of plasmablasts showing just IgHA1. They're not showing IgHG1. That's a good sign. We don't expect to see anything that's cyan between green and blue, and we don't. So that's very nice. Um, here we actually see ones. So you don't just have a heavy chain. You also have a light chain. You can be either kappa or a lambda light chain. So right here, I just happen to color in the kappa light chains. And so what we're expecting to see is some subset of the IGHA ones. They don't have kappa. They probably have lambda. And some subset here are yellow. So they show kappa. And it's a really nice concrete subset. Um, and then we see the same thing here. So in blue is IgG1. And in the magenta is the IgG1 with the kappa light chain. So again, these are really nicely differentiated subgroups based on isotype. And we can map this out with confidence because we've shown with the ONT data set, we're seeing the entirety of that read. And so we can feel really good about it. Um, and then we also see here, these are just Ig kappa, and that means that they're not IgHA1 or IgHG1. They might be, say, another IgHG subtype, which we couldn't have previously pulled out. Um, and so these differences are really important. And I'll show you just one of the reasons why. And so one of the nice things when we're using full single cell after the 10x using ONT, we're successfully getting the isotypes, but then we can start making correlations to what those single cell transcriptomics are showing. And so for here, um, what I'll show you is B4GALT1. And I'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about what this does, but this is an enzyme involved in glycosylation of antibodies. And so in B4GALT1, this enzyme uh, is particularly active. The glycosylation that it adds allows it to be a more uh, uh, ADCC, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an antibody that's able to affect ADCC type activity more often, and also some complement type activity more often. And then we're able to map that back to the subtypes it's associated with. And we didn't necessarily expect to see with different isotypes, different, you know, say, glycosylation factors being prominent. Um, and that's really exciting data that just we couldn't have seen before. It's something that's made special by the ONT setup for this kind of, you know, uh, straightforward pipeline. 
Um, and so what we see here is that there's significant enrichment here in that IGHG1 subtype. And when we actually have IGHG2, 3, and 4, we see a little bit of enrichment, but not so much. Um, it's mostly in the IGHG1. So being able to successfully parse out what's IGHG1 and what's not is really important. Um, and we're able to even do kind of some differential expression analysis. And we see things like, you know, even comparing these IGHG subsets to each other, 2, 3, and 4 versus 1, we're showing things like ITPR2 is a gene that's involved in B cell longevity. And that might have implications downstream for what B cells are able to become long-lived, and that might be correlated with subtype. And these are questions that just simply weren't sufficiently answerable before um, or were otherwise hard to answer. And so it just shows, you know, when we really dig into this data, the kind of interesting things we might find that we didn't necessarily expect to find. Um, and so this is looking at it a bit more, and this isn't just, you know, going to happen with any old gene. So we have Durlin-3 is a transcription factor associated with B cells. We have FUT8 is uh, also a glycosylation factor. And we see that those don't really correlate with anything specific. b 4 galt one is the only one showing up, and it's showing up different by subtype just visually in this UMAP, which is nice. And just to show you all again, this glycosylation step, um, it's right here, it's N297 on all antibodies, and B4GALT1, again, is able to show very different effector functions relative to some of these other enzymes. So yeah, increased ADCC, increased complement activation, that's going to have a fundamental difference on what those antibodies are doing and the type of role that they're playing in your immune response. Being able to pull that out is a really exciting part of what this project is able to accomplish. Um, and so we're still going right now. Uh, this data, we synthesized antigen-specific antibodies. Um, and so these are ones pulled from individual plasma blasts from those paired heavy and light chain transcripts. We went through, you know, ensured that they were real, assigned them, you know, aligned them to different genes, and then synthesized them. And we're going to test them against measles, mumps, and rubella virus in the lab. We're primarily a virology lab, so it's exciting to get the virus part in here too. Um, unfortunately, we got these synthesized in China, and with the lockdown happening in Shanghai, these got significantly delayed, so we've only just started receiving them. But you can see that we were able to select from a wide range of possible, like this is just looking at the heavy chain V-gene allele selected for a particular antibody. We even got three from that potentially novel allele, so that'll be exciting to see if those assigned to any particular neutralization for one of these, um, or match up in any of the ELISAs that we had to do. Um, but yeah, again, yeah, mapping back. That's the VG allele. It's part of the variable region. It helps dictate what you're capable of binding to as well. And what's nice too, when we have these paired uh, heavy and light chains, not only are we successfully getting the VDJ region and knowing what it's binding to, but we're going to successfully get the exact isotype that's being utilized. And that has a big effect on what that antibody is uh, you know, capable of doing. So in summary, it's a lot of stuff happening and a lot is continuing to happen. We still have things upcoming that we're analyzing, but we were able to annotate the subject's unique immune repertoire, compare the transcriptomes of subgroups of the plasma blast population, identify linked heavy and light chains, um, and all this was able to happen with ONT. So for example, you know, the uh, annotation step happened in a minion, the single cell step happened with promethion, just really exciting stuff with a single technology that we were able to do. Um, but yeah, I'm one very small part of this large team. Uh, I'd love to thank my lab. Um, I'd love to especially thank Andy did a lot of work, Chuan did a lot of work, the whole lab did a ton. And then in particular, the Oxford Nanopore Technologies uh, Genomic Applications team. I know John Belaurier uh, and Alex Strong did a ton of work on Sockeye, and then others like Lynn. I mean, everybody did tons of work. Scott did lots of work. So uh, we were very excited to work with them. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And I'll take any questions. <laughs>